everybody, welcome back to the channel. We've spoken a lot about ways that you can maximize your odds of winning with on the field adjustments. Be it things you can do with snitch on pitch, in terms of managing your beaters, uh, things you can do to attack different defenses, etc. But there's some really key off the field adjustments that can be made as well that can be just as important in determining your chances to win. And really, this one specifically is why I think there's so much value in having a non-playing personnel on the sidelines managing your games. Because this is something that is almost impossible to manage if your captain is one of your best players who's playing the majority of your minutes and just simply can't do it from being on the field. So today we're talking about personnel management in tournaments. And this is kind of on two scales. So this is how you want to manage your personnel from the beginning of game one of a tournament all the way till the finals, and also how to best manage your personnel in key games. And in both ways, you can lose a lot of value, a lot of expected value of winning if you don't do these things correctly. So let's get into it. The first situation I want to highlight is from a game we've already covered on this channel between QC Boston and Lone Star Quidditch Club. This is the semifinals of US Quidditch Cup 9, which QC Boston would go on to win, eventually beating this Lone Star team. And while this isn't a final, I think a lot of people thought this kind of was being treated like a final. I think most people thought these two teams were better than the two teams playing in the other semifinal. So both of these teams really should have been treating this like it was the game that decides everything for them. That means maximizing playtime. And in this game, I believe Harry Greenhouse and QC Boston plays almost the entire game, subs out maybe a minute or two before 18 minutes in order to go and seek. Lone Star came into this game with a different approach. They were very much prioritizing playing equal minutes for everybody. And as talented as this Lone Star team was, and I mean they were very, very, very talented, they still had some players that were better than others. Most prominently, Drew Wazikowski, the player with the quaffle here. What I'm going to do really fast is we're going to go through and watch every single Drew Wazikowski offensive possession from the beginning of this game. First possession, one goal. Second possession. Good ball movement, two goals. Third possession. Finally gets stopped. Another stop in fourth possession. And he subs out. At 4 minutes and 21 seconds, Drew Wazikowski ran four possessions. Nobody ever successfully tackled him. And they converted on two of the four. Which, against a talented team like QC Boston, I mean, you saw Max Havlin and Louis, who were the beaters on the other side. Harry Greenhouse, Tyra Trudeau. These are all Team USA players playing in this game. Two of four possessions, very solid. You could argue that's... Honestly, some of the other issues were strategic. And more importantly, like I said, nobody laid a hand on him on those four possessions. Let's see when he next enters the game. All right, here he is. Next time he's into the game, he left at 4 minutes and 20 seconds. He re-entered at 12 minutes and 40 seconds. A player who was making the Lone Star offense tick played for four and a half minutes, and then sat out for over eight minutes. And in those eight minutes, remember, it was 20 nothing when he left. The team scored twice and allowed three goals. So plus 20 in two minutes that he was on the pitch, and then minus 10 for eight minutes and 20 seconds when he was off the pitch. Let's see how this first, literal first possession goes with him back on the field. Goal scored against them. And then he's going to bring it down, immediately be a point defender again, and that's going to be called a goal when all is said and done. And we go to his next possession. Again, a free drive. Nobody able to lay a hand on him. I believe that shot just barely missed. Again, nobody can touch him. Another pass, another goal. He is now scored, or he's converted for his offense on... Four of seven possessions in the game, and yet he's only gotten to play seven possessions in this game. At this point, we're at 15 minutes. 
Then he's going to get a stop here. And I believe he is immediately going to sub out of the game. So, let's recap. He played for four and a half minutes, scored on two of four possessions, sat out over eight minutes, played for another four minutes, scored on two of three offensive possessions, making him four of seven for the game, and then he subbed out again. And at this point, the damage has been done, right? Lone Star fails to pull out of range of QCB. Harry Greenhouse catches fairly quickly with QCB down 20, which means even a little more offensive output could have forced overtime and a moderate amount of more offensive output could have forced the game out of range easily. But because Drewski only got seven total offensive possessions in 18 minutes, this game was in range and Lone Star got eliminated. So for the next example, I'm going to go all the way back to 2016 and talk about the infamous final between Team USA and Australia, the game that Australia won to become gold medalists of the World Cup that year. The game that's been talked about a lot. Now, unfortunately, we're going to be using this kind of boring screen I made because the film quality is not good. I really didn't want to show it to you. You would have been watching a lot of blurs run around. I would have had to explain everything. It just wasn't worth it. Instead, we're just going to go through the lineup strategies that the U.S. used in this game and the result of them. So, right off the bat, the U.S. broke one of my rules, right? So, they didn't start their best chance to win. They came out in their third line, and I'm 99% sure... This wasn't a concept of this is our best chance to win because I think it was pretty well defined that this was the third line of the team. Uh, some of these players would go on to play with other players on the team in club after this and you know be way further down those depth charts. Between training camp and this whole weekend, I don't think any of this was necessarily unknown. I think this was pretty clearly the third line. Now, maybe the coaching staff just didn't think that there was a risk of losing this game. But in that case, like I say, you play your best chance, you get out of range, and then everybody can get play time. And the worst case is they don't because the other team played so well that it actually is a game and you did need to maximize your uh, top qualifier players. So they play for three minutes, they go down 20 nothing. And like I said earlier, in situations of small sample sizes, being down 20 nothing with only 15 minutes to get out of range starts to become a problem. You now have to outscore the other team by 60 points over the next 15 minutes in order to get out of range. And this Australia team was good enough to make the finals. They're a good team. Boss, uh, they make a transition here. They switch the Quaffle players out. They keep the beaters in. And so Jake Archibald comes in. Harry Greenhouse comes in. And Sam Hamowitz, I know he's not a Boston player, but he played with that line. So that's how I'm just kind of grouping him. And also Julia Bear. Two minutes of gameplay. They score a couple goals. They do allow one. 2010, now they're only down 10. They finally make the beater shift. They get Max Havlin, Ashley Calhoun in. I think it was pretty clear this was the best shift they had in this tournament. Uh, you know, other people might debate that. But regardless, they prove it on the field here, right? In six minutes of gameplay, they go 60-40. They have a ton of fast break transition. They mainly play with that Boston Quaffle set like I talked about. They do sh shift out towards the end of the set. But regardless, 60-40, right? At times, they're up 20. I, I don't know whether the Quaffle sub kind of made it so that it was only plus 20 instead of plus 30. Regardless, they're plus 20. This game is now plus 10 USA. They take Havlin and Calhoun out. We're at the 11-minute mark, right? I'm generally okay with this being a sub time for your best beater line, but ideally, they've played 11 minutes already, not 6 minutes already. And if they've only played six minutes, I want this to be a really, really short break, especially if they're having a lot of success, right? You need to get your best chances on the field. It seems like this combination of the Boston Quaffle players with the Havlin Calhoun line, also Sam Hamwitz, was getting your best result, right? Across those eight minutes of gameplay, they outscored Australia 80 to 50. That's really good. They go to the second line. They take Havlin Calhoun out. They never get back in Cinch on pitch. They do go back to that Quaffle line a little bit with the Archibald, Sam Hamowitz, Harry Greenhouse. Seven minutes of gameplay. It's 2020. That's okay to be getting out of your second line if, again, your first line played 12 minutes and your second line played six minutes. And then maybe this game is about, well, let's see. Let's do the math. Havlin Calhoun played six minutes. They were up plus 20. Let's say they played 12 minutes and that makes it plus 40. And the second line played the other six minutes and did even. 
guess what? You're out of range. But because they did a couple mistakes, they played their third line first, so they got behind, and they didn't get enough minutes out of the lines that was giving them the best results. At 18 minutes, time to stitch on pitch, USA plus 10, snitch range game 100% because Australia is physical enough to go back and forth with them in the quaffle game while everything's focused on the snitch. You flip a coin at that point, Australia wins the coin flip, Australia is your gold medal champions. Completely avoidable result from the Team USA, purely based on roster management, and they let themselves down here. All right, let's move into our second point. So you're in your big game, you're in your do or die situation, you're in your point where you want to give it your all. How do you maximize your key players' minutes in that game to get the best possible chance to win? First of all, I think it's important to note that it's kind of different how you maximize the minutes of your key qualified players and your key beaters. And the reason for that is really simple. Uh, playing Quaffle and Quidditch is not actually that tiring, specifically if you're playing keeper. Uh, if you're a keeper ball handler, you can really easily play an entire game because it's not hard to conserve energy when you're guarding the hoops. It's not hard to conserve energy when you're walking the ball up on offense. It, it's not hard to, you know, conserve energy throughout. Beaters, there's no real breaks. They're constantly making plays for budget control. They're constantly... Uh, exchanging, running after bludgers, etc. It's really hard for a beater to get the entire game played. And if you get to a point where you wait too long and you have to take them out because they're tired and suddenly they can't play snitch on pitch, or you feel they have to stay in for snitch on pitch, now you have a problem because you either have taking your best beater off for a snitch range snitch on pitch situation, or you kept them in, but they're too tired to be effective. There's always going to be exceptions. No rules, 100%. I talked to Max Havlin about this, and he said there's an edge case. If you have a beater who is in great shape, they have budget control like the whole game, they know how to use their mental game along with their physical game so they're not constantly running, and they can conserve energy by doing that, and they have a partner, ideally, who can carry some of the burden, then it becomes a lot more realistic to play an entire 18 minutes. But I, I honestly, unless you've got... You know, a Max have one on your team. I don't think I'd even bother to consider that. I think you need to be working under the rule that your key beater should never play the entire 18 minutes of seeker floor. As you go through the game, you want to use your timeouts to maximize the breaks of your key players. So what do I mean by that? So let's say you want to get your key player out in the middle of the game, kind of a low leverage situation, and you really want to maximize that time. So you... Take them out. You let one possession go on each team. You get possession back. You call timeout. The timeout gets worked out. That probably takes a minute and a half total. That first possession maybe took two minutes. You let each team get one more possession, maybe another two minutes. Boom. In four total possessions, you manage to get your key player a full five and a half minute break. And you can do this for multiple key players. You can do kind of your keeper, who's your best player, and your best beater at the same time. Maximize that value of that timeout. Timeout's are valuable strategy tools, but they don't only have to be strategy tools, they're also valuable tools to get a break. And if you're trying to kind of scheme this out, there's no hard and fast rule, but I think kind of the 11 to 14 minute range is a good time to be getting your key players rest. Most of your key players are gonna be good to go for nine or 10 minutes. You can probably stretch that out a little further, but for beaters specifically, you need to get them in in time to make plays for budget control and to get back in the flow of the game before snitch on pitch. You don't want to be getting them back in at like 17.30. And even more than that, though, is communicating with these players, right? Every time there's a stoppage, if I'm trying to maximize a key player's minutes in a game, so I have this in my head already. I know the situation. It's a key game. It's a tournament final. I want to get as much of them as I can out of them. Every single stoppage, I am talking to them. I am walking on the field. I'm communicating with them. I'm telling them to let me know on the sideline. Hey, if you're feeling tired, let me know. If you're going to need a break, I need two possessions, let me know. Every every time there's a stoppage, I'm asking you, how many more minutes you can play? How are you feeling? What percent do you think you're at? I don't want these players dropping their percentage off precipitously because A, it's going to affect them later in the game, and B, then they're, we're not maximizing them anymore, right? They're they're no longer necessarily the best player on our team, a 70% version of them. So it's all about communicating with your players, giving them what they need to get through the game. But, you know, if, if you have players who are generally in good shape, I do like this 11-14 minute range. I think a lot of 
teams are on their second or third lines at that point. So it's not a big of a deal to take that key player out and you get them in in time to reestablish themselves before snitch on pitch. So let's look at a few examples where this wasn't done as well and then one where it was. So the first case I want to talk about is from the 2019 West Regional Finals between Cal and Utah State. And just to give you a bit of a background, so Cal exclusively plays a two-male beater set. And they're presumed number one based on minutes played. And I've watched a lot of Cal over the last couple of days in, in preparation for this video. So I feel fairly confident saying this. Is Connor Hughes. Uh, he's the player standing at the hoops right here. The player that controls this team's subline and a lot of their coaching is Arden Lowe. Uh, he's the beater that's right here. Now, this is relevant because, as I said, it's really hard to manage these positions from an on-field situation. So here is how the rotations have worked for Cal to this point in the game. And for full context, Cal is winning 50 nothing right now against Utah State. And we're at the 14-minute and 45-second mark. Hugh started the game um, with... Ivan, who is their presumed number two, he, Ivan came out for Ard, uh, for their number 13, and then Arden came in for number 13. Hughes has not left this game at this point, so he's at 14 minutes and 45 seconds of gameplay straight. He's gotten them a 50 nothing lead, which is great, but this is the point where you need to be getting him off the field. So why is this? First of all, you're in no immediate danger. You're up 50 nothing, so you can even concede a goal or two, get him some fresh rest, get him ready for snitch on pitch. If you keep him on, you risk it getting into range and him tiring out simultaneously, so now he's not fresh for snitch on pitch, and he's getting more tired. But this is a call that needs to be made by the coach, who, like I said, is on the field right now, which really complicates things. And the thing I didn't even touch on is, what if Hughes is getting tired at this point, right? He's 15 minutes into playing, he's done a lot of running in this game. And he doesn't really have anybody to communicate that to or nobody's really asking him about it. So what could have been differently? I think this sub could have been taken earlier. Like I said, Cal hasn't given up a point. They were up 30 nothing as early as eight minutes. Uh, it's slowly, I think the fifth goal was just scored. The fourth goal was probably scored at like the 12-minute mark. Up 40 nothing in the 12-minute mark, that sounds like a great, great time to get Hughes out of this game. Instead, he stays in, and we're going to kind of run through the the issues with him staying in here. Utah State's going to have bludger control. And you're going to start to see him make plays that seem to kind of show a certain level of tiredness, right? That's a really, really long beat that he throws off of his teammate who had the ball carrier wrapped at no risk. So he gives up that first goal basically by making a lazy throw. And not, not only that, because they didn't score right off of it. He threw it so far off that it was no bludger long enough for Utah State to get a goal on a rebound. So he's going to come into the game here. This is another lazy play, right? He tells, he's kind of turn away, telling people to slow it down, allows a free tap beat by the Utah State beater. Now his teammate, uh, his other beater is alone, right? And look how long it's going to take him to get back into this play. It's enough time for Utah State to beat his teammate, press the ball, I, I honestly don't know where Fuse goes on this play. I don't know if maybe he was trying to take a sub or what, but maybe the ball just went really far away and he had to chase it down. So by getting beat there, he left his teammate on an island. He got blown up. That's a free turnover. And again, there was there's no real need for him to be getting beat there, right? It was just because he kind of lazily had turned around. So now he has the ball again. We talked about that lazy beat we saw the first time around. This time he makes a beat all the way at the top of the field that hits its mark it didn't do anything. He had no teammates there. There was no good outcome of that. So he created no budger on a throw that had zero chance of ever creating a turnover because he had no call for players to pick it up. Uh, so that makes it 50-20. Now, basically three straight possessions kind of at the fault seemingly of kind of that exhaustion level he's getting to, which is totally understandable because he's played 16 straight minutes at beater. Now this play is a little less involved in. Now, you t look what happened. He throws the ball back, and he's kind of taking his time getting to that ball. Utah State wins the race all the way back to the ball and keeps bludger control off of it. So now it's 50-20. It's snitch range. He still hasn't gotten a sub. 
And the stitch is about to come on. So now if you sub him out, you're taking your best beater off the pitch at a crucial, crucial moment of the game. And they're going to eventually choose not to do that. Again, he gets blown up there. Utah State comes in and scores. Three straight possessions, three goals. Utah State abused them in the beater game for those three, basically, offensive and defensive possessions in a row. 50-30, snitch on pitch. He ends up staying out. Utah State eventually catches and wins the game. Could have been completely different if they could have gotten him some fresh legs there. Let's look at another one. So this next example comes from the Massachusetts Quidditch Conference, just a regular season meet about a month ago between Tufts and RPI. This is coming right off of a timeout that was called, right about the 16-minute mark of play, and the score is 40-40. to The key thing to note here is that RPI's male beater, Carson Olazaba, has absolutely dominated this game. Tufts has not had an answer for him at all in the beater game. He's gotten anything he's wanted. They've had a ton of water control. They've been able to turn that into a lot of positive things. That said, it's 40-40. The odds of this game is not going to be in snitch range are extremely low. If he's the beater that's been dominating this game for you, especially knowing that Tufts has a dominant seeker in Henry Bear Benson that needs to be handled with beaters if you want to have a shot in the game, subbing around this time out, ideally before it, honestly, at 40-40, I would have liked to see him come out of the game maybe two minutes ago, but maybe immediately after it at least so he can get back in at 18. Instead, we're going to see how this proceeds so like I said, about 16 minutes, 40-40. We're going to get a chance to see kind of how dominant he is against these tough speeders a bit before we see the mistakes made in strategy from there. So he's able to keep water control there. The, the chasers are able to force a turnover. That makes it 50-40. And now snitch on pitch. At 17 minutes. Bludger control is obviously the priority. He's going to make some really smart plays here, by the way. The way he corrals that Bludger in. Then he sees his teammates going to need help to keep Bludger control. So he prioritizes that. He does everything right here. I mean, even if tough scores there to go 50-50, that's fine. It's not going to change the game. It's a snitch range game. That's what it's going to come down to. So they force the turnover. They're up 10. And this is the moment, and we got to be at about 17.30 here, where they choose to finally sub Olazaba out of this game. Literally with it about to be snitch on pitch in a snitch range game. And watch how rapidly this is about to backfire on RPI. His backup basically immediately loses bludger control or at least loses control over the situation around snitch on pitch. I think that one loses budget control. I don't know if this catch is going to happen on screen. Yeah, it does. Yep, that's all it took. You can see at the time of the catch, both RPI beaters are standing right there. Neither one of them has a bludger in their hand. So after dominating budget control... They sub Olazaba out right as Stitch on Pitch comes out and Tufts catches in about a minute at a time where RPI had literally zero budgers. That's just poor management of your beaters, right? There's no reason Olazaba didn't get his rest before 18 minutes. Him getting it right at 18 minutes was just inexcusable. So now I just want to show a quick example of kind of how I like to handle these situations uh, to kind of maximize time to get a star player rest and also kind of communicating with players, etc. So in this case, uh, this is from the beginning of the season this year, uh, the Massachusetts Quidditch Conference opener. It's Harvard versus Tufts. So the star player I'm talking about here is Michael uh, the our beater, who doesn't really kind of, it's kind of irreplaceable in the way we run our team in a lot of ways, but still obviously can't play every minute of every game. So we're trying to make sure we get him rest at the right time. We're coming up on the eight minute mark of the game, usually a little earlier than I'd like to sub them out, but we've been communicating uh, of a couple plays ago, we were talking about maybe a couple possessions. He seemed to be wearing a little faster than he usually does. So first I wanna show you how maybe we even waited a little too long here because this is just kind of a lazy beat from Soup and you can see the way he almost just kind of walks after it. He does eventually try to make an athletic play there, but just, just overall you could see his tiredness kind of starting to show there. 
So right away, we need to pull the plug on him. We're going to do it as soon as this defensive stop happens. Yep, and it happens right there. So, like I said, we get him off the field about the eight-minute mark. So now the goal, and it's 10.13 on the YouTube video, so we can see how many real-time minutes of break he gets here. First thing I do, I immediately slow the pace of the game, right? Because the less possessions that happen with him off the field, the better for my team. So, I mean, we probably just bought 20 seconds there walking across half field. These are the kind of things that we want to be doing to maximize what we can do while he's off the pitch. Immediately, Tufts is kind of pressuring us. I think we're going to eventually turn it over here. Regardless, I mean, these are the kind of things that happen when you're playing without maybe your, your top, top player, but you're trying to minimize the impact still. Going to be a goal for Tufts. So now each team's gotten one goal. I'm already communicating with Soup on the sidelines here. Hey, how much time are you going to need? We call our timeout right in the middle of his break to kind of maximize. And the good thing about timeout is even though it's a one-minute timeout, you're always going to get a little bit more time than that. So we're going to run an offensive possession here. Again, slow, slow, slow pacing. Honestly, I, I think they're going to go faster than I'd even like them to. This is really early in the season. We're still kind of working things out. I, I think that shot might have even gone in. No, no, I guess not. So this is possession two for Tufts. We also have gotten two possessions since he came out of the game. We get a stop. In fact, we get a ball going the other way. Uh, there was good play by our beaters there to make that happen. So now we've even managed to get 10-10 in these two possessions that he's off the field. I guess it's three for us now, two for them. But that, that wasn't much of a possession. Maybe it ends up being a goal. No, it doesn't. Tufts is going to score one more time here. Eventually off the reset. Yep, here it comes. And then we'll sub. So we said 10, 15, 10 13, I believe, was the time of the original substitution. It's now 18 16. He got a full eight minutes of rest. I think probably about four minutes of gameplay, maybe four or five possessions to each team. And now he's going to be ready to play the rest of the game. Using timeouts, using slow ball, using the right stoppages at the right time, you can really get as much rest as possible without actually missing that many game minutes, and that can make all the difference in situations like this. So my third and final point today is more of a tournament general uh, philosophy on how to manage minutes. So you hear a lot that, you know, especially when you're in bracket play, but I mean, I guess even in pool play, that you can't look ahead to the next game. You got to win this game, right? And my dad used to espouse that all the time when it came to Little League. You can't save your number one pitcher for the finals. You need to get through the semifinals first. And yes, there's some, you know, reason to think like that. I mean, there's positive logic to that. You, you, there's no, you can't save your pitcher for a game, for example, that you're not going to be playing in. But it's really not that simple, right? Because if your only goal is to win the tournament, then Winning the semifinal and setting yourself up to be unable to win the final isn't actually any better for you than than failing to get through the semifinal to begin with, right? Because your only goal was to win both games. You actually want to maximize the ability to win both games. So the first thing you need to do in a tournament is set your realistic goal for that tournament. And this isn't one of those, oh, our team always wants to go out there and win that, that's great. That's not what a realistic goal is. In regionals, are you looking to win regionals or are you looking to qualify? At nationals, do you think you can realistically win or do you just want to get out of bracket play? Is that kind of the, the core goal for your team? Because that all has to advise the way that you manage your roster, right? If your only goal is to get a bid, then every time you're playing for a bid in that regionals, you should be maximizing your key players' play time like we've talked about before to win. If your goal, though, is to win the tournament, you need to be resting those players as much as possible every game. I think the easiest way to look at this is this. If you look through a bracket and you think of each round, you have to put out X much energy to win. A lot of people are like, okay, we're going to put out 100% in the round of 16, and then 100% of what we have left in the round of 8, 
100 percent of what we have left in the, the semifinals and etc that's not what you want you need to find the threshold you need to put into a game in order to win it and that's all you want to stay above i would rather win my round of 16 my quarterfinals and my semifinals each being up 50 when i caught to win by 80 than to win all of them by 150 and then have nothing left in the game gas tank for the finals because my goal was to win the finals so the second a game is getting comfortable you need to figure out a how you're changing your roster management to maximize rest in that game and b how you are changing strategic decisions to get out of that game cleanly despite that so first of all getting your good players off the field can be one of it and then things we've talked about already you know slowing the ball down slowing the pace down uh, maximizing chances for your seeker to catch if it's a snitch on pitch situation. You, you don't want to run back and forth and back and forth. You don't want to play a million possessions in a game that's just going to get you more tired, even your depth, who you might need later if you're playing a million possessions. So long, slow possessions, tap beat out defensive seekers is a great strategy. Um, even in situations where it's not snitch on pitch yet, you can slow the game down. Getting your star players as much rest as you can matches is going to matter down the line. That extra five minutes that you kept them off a of field can matter in the finals, even if those five minutes happen in the first first game of the day. And it should be part of your thought process in every single game that starts to become a blowout in your favor. Or honestly, even a game that goes against you, right? Let's say you're in pool play and a team is starting to blow you out, but you're still going to advance to bracket play whether they blow you out or not. Maybe don't put all of your energy into trying to come back in that game if it seems pretty unrealistic hey if you have a chance to come back that's great but it's not a bad time to consider a suicide snitch it's not a bad time to go to your depth if you still have life in a tournament after a blowout loss then maybe coming back in that blowout loss isn't your best path to achieving your goals in that tournament so let's take an example of a good a bad example of doing this and a good example of doing the first thing i want to talk about and i know i'm going back to cal again it's just because i happen to be studying them a lot for another video I was going to make, and this is kind of what got me thinking about the idea in the first place. So let's talk about Cal's player management at US Quidditch Cup 12. So we already saw them in their West Regional final, right? And we learned that they basically overplayed Connor Hughes, their beater one, and it kind of cost them. So now we get to their US Quidditch Cup run. They're in the semifinals. They're facing NYU, who also ironically was gassed from playing a marathon game against Maryland that they came back from the quarterfinals, that's a game they didn't have a choice to gas themselves in. They had came back in that game. So no, no, NYU didn't do anything wrong in this case. And this game is firmly decided by the 16-minute mark. It's 90-20 Cal. It's honestly, you could argue, firmly decided before that. But I like to say 70 points is a nice firm lead where it's like you should be able to hold that just by good game management. You don't necessarily need to keep running the, up the game. Now, what was Cal doing in this situation, right? Well, they learned one lesson, they didn't learn other lessons. So Hughes, they didn't start him in this game, which is great. He got to rest six minutes. Then he played a 16-minute straight shift as the point differential was going over 100 points. So he played to the 22-minute mark. First of all, clearly they were affecting him with him off the pitch because they had opened up a lead early. But then second of all, you learned your lesson about him getting tired out from the West Regionals. So then why are you running him into the ground when you have four beaters that you rotate through who are all relatively effective and all have been effective in this game, and you're playing him for 16 minutes here? Meanwhile, Ryan Fetting, their keeper, uh, who also basically played the, that entire West Regional Final, comes in this game. He got injured in the RPI quarterfinal, so he's playing with an injury, and he played all 18 minutes of the secret floor in this game and then kept playing until snitch on pitch. I think they finally got him a sub late, late, late. But... You have a final to play. I don't think your goal here was to make the final, right? You want to win the final. So you are you need to be doing everything you can to maximize that. As soon as it's a 70-point lead, and then especially as it explodes to over 100, you need to be maximizing your minutes for your star players. And instead, they ran so many minutes of them in a game that was no longer up for grabs. And that leads to the finals. So what happens in the finals? Fenning basically plays the entire finals too, and he looks gassed or injured or something. All he ever does is walk the ball to midfield and loop balls over the back. I think everybody is familiar with it at this point. Loop balls over the back 
of the entire defense, and a couple of them work, and the rest of them are turnovers. He never resets when UT's beaters press. He doesn't do a great job defensively. He doesn't really step to a lot of shots from Luke Mesner. I mean, you can watch this game, and I think I'm going to review it pretty soon as well, but I, it was just hard to clip it right for what it would be good for this game. Meanwhile, Hughes, and I talked to the team's coach about this just today, didn't play that much in the finals because he was pretty gassed at that point. And it makes sense. He played a 16-minute shift he didn't need to in the semifinals just an hour or two ago. He plays only six minutes of the secret floor. Remember, he played 18 secret floor minutes against Utah State, and he played 12 secret floor minutes against NYU, and then also played the first six minutes of uh, Central Pitch, or I guess the first four minutes of Central Pitch, sorry. And he played six total secret floor minutes. Now, they were minus 30 in those six minutes. It's not to say that he changed the game, but who knows what a slightly less gassed Ryan Fenning and a slightly less gassed Connor Hughes does for this game against UT. Because as much as we remember this game to be one-sided, it was 70-20, so a plus 50 margin for a few minutes at about the 11, 12, 13 minute mark. And if Hughes had a bit more energy to press and if Fenning had a bit more energy to press, maybe that moves the needle because Hughes wasn't even in the game when this game was close for a while there. Maybe he could have affected it. Instead, we'll never know. And it's because of that kind of poor player management we saw from them both at the regional final stage and at the national final stage. So I wanted to compare this to kind of, again, how I handle these types of situations. So this is from regionals this year. Northeast regionals is the University of Rochester versus Harvard. This is the one, pot one team versus pot two team in our pool. Uh, so kind of the biggest game of the day, but still very early in the tournament. I believe we had at least one more game to play just on this day. And obviously we wanted to compete for a regional title as well. This game was never that much of a blowout. I believe right now it is Harvard plus 60 snitch on pitch. As you can see, there's about five minutes left in this tape. So you're going to see Soup here, our beater, is going to blow up the play, beats their beater, beats the quaffle. It's going to go the other way. And it's going to make it plus 70. Now, we never really had a chance to rest him much up until this point. It was always kind of close. But plus 70, snitch on pitch. We trust that our team is going to be able to manage this situation with our help the rest of the way. So it is no longer worth his minutes in what's likely to be a bit of a marathon of a tournament, right? So instant sub out. We know all the things we're going to do now, just like we talked about in that last video. If he was subbing out in the middle of the game, we're going to slow down the pace. We're going to play smart. We're going to give our seeker a chance to catch. Now, is this really life-changing stuff? I mean, no. It's As you can see, it probably earned him five minutes extra real-time rest. But that adds up over the course of the tournament. You do that if you... And I know it's never going to work out exactly this way, but if you do that every game for six games until you make a finals run, that's 30 minutes over the course of the weekend. That's basically over a full match is worth of extra play time. I mean, these things matter. These things add up. Every minute counts in terms of the energy a player is going to have in a big moment. And so, yeah, is this a big deal? No, but you can see the kind of effect it can have when Cal didn't use this to its fullest effect last season. And you can see how we're just kind of looking to maximize every last minute of rest we can give our key players in situations like this. When there's a situation in a tournament where the game is decided, it doesn't have to be a blowout. It didn't matter to us Especially because, remember, points against is first tiebreaker. It's not point differential. We don't need to blow these teams out. We W's are all that matter. This game is always going to be a W. You see how in control our Quaffle players are here, even in this scenario. Where they're not taking any risks. They're running down time. They're giving the secret chance to work. We don't have to play a ton of possessions, but we're getting players rest, and that's what matters, and that's the kind of small details that can decide tournaments. So what did we learn today? So we spent a lot of time kind of breaking down the minutia of what you can do in substitutions throughout a tournament to really maximize your chances of winning. And there's a few key points where I see a lot of teams losing win percentage value, expected value, just on these little decisions. First one that we talked about is maximizing, you know, playing your best players when you can, right? So... You, everyone doesn't need to get equal playing time. This is, of course, only if you're trying to maximize your chance to win the tournament. Everyone shouldn't get equal playing time. Your best playing player should get more time. 
and you should treat every game as though it's going to be a challenge. You should go out looking to win every game and then make adjustments based on the way the game goes because there's so much variety in such a small sample size of possessions that you don't want to risk it by playing your depth too early in a game. Second thing we talked about is maximizing your key player's minutes in big games. And that's through the use of properly timed substitutions, specifically maybe halfway through secret floor is usually a good time, using your timeout to extend those even longer, and really making sure you're communicating with them at every stage and kind of watching their play to watch their body language so that you can make the right judgments on when they need to come out of the game. And the third one is that throughout a tournament, you want to minimize how much your best players are playing in games they don't need to be playing in. You don't need to win every game by 150 points. That's not even how the tiebreakers work anymore. What's most important is keeping them rested and keeping W's coming up on the scoreboard. And as long as you're doing those two things, you're going to be in good shape. I hope you enjoyed this piece. I really think personnel management is one of the most under-discussed, important pieces of making a deep tournament run. And I hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to like and subscribe and take care.